You're listening to the Rethreading Madness podcast, which airs live on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. We are recorded and produced on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Slayway Tooth Nations around Vancouver, B.C. I'm your host, Bernadine Fox, and this is the show that dares to change how we think about mental health. Welcome to our show. When I've never been further, no. I'm talking with Carolyn Clement, an award-winning family photographer, mother of two, and a survivor of therapy, child, and sibling abuse, and Amy Avalon, who is a retired private practice therapist and a passionate advocate for survivors of sexual and emotional abuse by their therapist. She helps raise awareness of widespread unethical conduct and abuse in psychotherapy field. I just want to take a moment to let people know that we're going to talk about some difficult material. It's about emotional, sexual, and even physical abuse at the hands of one's therapist. The content may be triggering, and we ask folks to do what they need to do to take care of themselves during this hour. Just to sort of introduce this topic, I want to go back as far as Freud, because Freud started out something that actually has carried on to today that ha- causes a lot of problems for people who are being exploited by their therapist. And what he did was he claimed that sexual abuse survivors were unable to discern between truth and fantasy and appointed therapists to do so on their client's behalf. And of course, Freud is long dead and buried, but that particular idea has persisted. So when a client comes forward and complains or discloses an assault by their therapist, be it sexual or emotional or physical, they experience an uphill battle getting police, victim services, and even sexual assault centers to hold the professional accountable because in part, the therapist has been given the power to define their client's reality. So most of us who start therapy are not aware when we walk in what ethical boundaries are that our therapists must adhere to. We are also told to trust the therapist and to tell them our fears and secrets. And if we have difficulty doing that, we're often told to jump out of our comfort zone and that our inability to trust is neurotic and thus the therapist is there to help us. And while that trust is an absolute necessity within the healing process, it is also the thing an unethical therapist will take advantage of and exploit. So the three of us, Amy, Carolyn, and myself, are going to chat about our collective experiences dealing with unethical therapists who caused us harm. And as Amy said, there is a widespread unethical conduct happening in the psychotherapy field. That harm often leaves their clients in a worse place than when they started therapy. And hopefully in doing this chat with all you folks, it's our hope that you will gain valuable information about what is and isn't okay in therapy and what to do if it is happening to you or someone you know and where to go to get support. Language makes this issue very difficult to find information around exploitation by therapists and many people who reach out to tell an organization both Amy and I are involved in and and, and volunteer um, to support other survivors globally, um, they describe an agonizing process of trying to find help for what they are going through. So our inadequate language makes it difficult to find help. So I'm going to give you resources at the end of this program. So when you have a moment, go and get your paper and pens. So welcome, Amy and Caroline. Thank you. Bernie. Well, thank you. I just want to make sure, Caroline, I'm saying your name right. It's not uh, Carolyn or it's Caroline. It's Carolyn. Carolyn, thank, thank you. Thank you for letting us know that. So both of you have experienced um, exploitation, abuse at the hands of your therapist. Um, no, but for Carolyn, it is your therapist. For myself, it was my therapist. But for Amy, I believe it was your colleague. Am I correct? 
Yes, that's correct. It was um, a colleague that I knew and just really adored and respected for over 15 years. I had actually uh, even, you know, been through training with him, someone that I thought I knew very, very well. Um, through the years, as, as we worked together, there was a lot of gaslighting going on that I couldn't quite put my finger on because I didn't have enough understanding of, of really what, what was going on. And it was so subtle. And uh, like, like much of therapy abuse, uh, it happens very subtly, like water on a rock. So you don't really know. Um, and then I, I later discovered that he was sexually abusing a patient. And so I had to intervene and take the steps to try to stop that. Uh, and it really turned my life upside down. So how did you find out he was sexually assaulting a client? He actually told me. He <laughs> and told you? Is, he actually told me, yes. Um, I think that's another part of this is, is it, I would later find out that this is not, this was not his first offense. And as the years go by, a lot of these abusers, most of them, the vast majority are serial abusers. Mm -hmm. while, while the vast majority of victims believe that they are the only one that this mm -hmm. is happening to, that's usually not the case. But, um, but there were other victims, but he had grown in his arrogance because no one had ever come forward. Uh, no one had ever called it abuse. No one had ever held him accountable. And so he told me thinking that, uh, you know, I'd be, maybe I'd even be happy for him that he found someone that he cared about. Um, he also, you know, said that he was helping this client. That's, that's also very common in, in this, uh, in this issue. And, uh, and he was absolutely shocked when I immediately said, I will be, you know, I will be taking action immediately. And, um, and how long, how, sorry, I'm going to interrupt. How long yeah. do you think he was um, abusing his clients over what kind of time frame? I, I mean, to answer that question in the way that I'd like to is I, I don't think that these people ever don't abuse in mm. some way in all of their relationship. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, this is the way that they interact. And so there are different levels of severity and there are different kinds of relationships that he was abusive in his relationship with me, you know, just as a colleague. He was abusive in his sibling relationships. He was abusive in his previous career with his right. other um, business partners. He, he was abusive to the person at the par the parking attendant, you know, subtly and not so subtly. But I, I really think that this was pretty much just how he was oriented to the world. And I think that that's true of the vast majority of the abusers who are therapists. Is that, and that's why they don't feel like they need to be held accountable because they don't, right. they don't really, this is just how they work with people. It's always right. a power differential and it's always a power grab for them. Most of us seek harmony and mutual benefit in our relationships. The abuser is always seeking power over and yes. taking and it's also interesting when you said serial abuser, because as you describe that, of course, I'm thinking child molesters, serial rapists, mm -hmm. uh, batterers, you know, I mean, it, it's not uncommon that people abuse who abuse do so in a serial way. Carolyn, what happened for you? Uh, well, I, I decided to go see a therapist. Um, I wanted to work on some my childhood issues that were coming up. I was a mother to a young child and I thought this was a great time for me to address some of the, the issues that I had had or patterns that were coming up. And so I went to therapy and that's where um, everything started out okay until at one point I started having these feelings <clears throat> where it was just really nice to be in a space where someone was kind and giving me a lot of attention and just very supportive. And those, that attention and that, that directed towards me um, made me have these warm and fuzzy feelings. And so mm -hmm. I, I had gone online and checked what to do about it and everything suggested that it could be helpful in therapy. And so I, even though I was embarrassed and it was difficult to bring it up, I did tell my therapist that I was having these feelings um, of transference. And I believe that from that moment on, um, 
I was no longer, he was pulling the strings at that point. I was no longer um, able to make decisions on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, So he, I was in therapy with him for only four months. And I think I started mentioning transference within the first two. And then he slowly started introducing it into every subsequent session. So what happened is I had cried. I cried in a session with him and I became very uncomfortable. I do not like showing emotion. I don't like being looked at. And I remember he was just staring at me so intensely. And I, I remember saying, well, don't just stare at me because I was crying and I didn't felt very awkward. And, and then because I was embarrassed, I said something along the lines of it's probably, um, you know, it's like, uh, a mating thing or I I feel uncomfortable like under your gaze while I'm crying like I don't I don't like that Mm -hmm. and so the next time that I had a session with him he said why don't we talk about that let's bring it up and so I really was trying to dismiss it and say it's okay I just think it's a really warm and fuzzy place to be here I enjoy coming and that's when he started um I thought it was subtle at the time now I don't think it was very subtle but he would start disclosing more about himself um, and telling me that I was objectively attractive, um, talented, creative, smart, bright. So he was, he was absolutely showing me that he was interested in me. And I remember telling him, um, well, actually, I don't want to get off topic, but he would ask me at the end of a session um, if there was anything that I would do with him, what I would want to experience with him. He told me that he would bring me to Pittsburgh, which is where he was from, um, and the things that he would do with me. He would bring me to a museum, the Andy Warhol Museum, because I'm an artist, and that he would bring me to a hotel. And this was all in session. And then he asked me what I would want to do with him. And I remember fumbling through what I would do in my hometown, because I have no idea. And it, so as the sessions were going on, he would move from the therapist chair over to his desk chair. So it's almost as though he was creating a boundary or making it seem like, ah, now the therapy is over. Why don't, why don't we just talk friend to friend? Or, um, and that's when he would extend the sessions as well. So by the, by the last month, I remember, and it was only once a month, so it happened really quickly. Um, we were definitely eating into the next session's time. Mm -hmm. and eventually he um, told me that I was done therapy and this was very sudden and abrupt and I did not see it coming because I definitely felt like I had more therapy to do still so much more to unpack about everything I'd been through and I got really upset with him because I felt like he was abandoning me in the same way that I had been abandoned as a child Mm -hmm. and it hurt me so much because again, I thought we were having a good rapport in therapy. And I just felt like, what have I done that he suddenly no longer wants to see me even for 50 minutes a week. Mm -hmm. So I got really upset. And I remember I sent an email and I said um, that, um, that he was fired, that I couldn't believe that he would do this to me. And, um, and he was so tone deaf because it's exactly what I had experienced. And he ended up telling me uh, to answer his call a few days later. Mm -hmm. And when I answered the call, the first thing that he said to me was, I am in love with you. Mm -hmm. And I gasped and I had no idea that that's, that that's what he was going to say. And I also feel like at that point, I, I was married. I was married. I had a child. And now I had this incredible secret, this tremendous pressure on me or burden that I either would have to say something to my husband or say something about the therapist and get him in trouble. And at the same time, I also feel like I really am falling in love with this person. Like I, I thought if he's a therapist and he's counseled so many relationships if he says that this is unlike anything else that he's ever had, he must mean it. And Mm -hmm. therefore I am willing to take the chance of 
ending my marriage and, and exploring that. And so everything just went, everything just fell apart from that moment. And so can I just stop you there, Carolyn? Yeah. Are you saying this all happened within a four month period? Correct. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you also said you met, you saw him once a month. Is, is that what you meant to say? Or cause that would mean four sessions. No, I'm sorry. It was four times in a month four times. Like, so yeah. once a week, once a week. Yes. Okay. All right. So, so what I'm getting from that is that he, he brought you along to a certain point and then abandoned you, you reacted to the abandonment. And then he, he sort of came back, uh, you know, in a one fell swoop with I'm in love with you. And, and so even, you know, feeling, you know, the way to fix not feeling abandoned is by engaging with him in this other way, um, just to keep yourself okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I, I felt I felt so wanted. I felt so like he would the fact that he would risk everything. He obviously right. must have meant it. It had to have been something that was real and not right. deliberate. And now right. I realize it was deliberate. I'm your host, Bernadine Fox, and today we're talking with Carolyn Clement and Amy Avalon about the impact of exploitation by therapists on their client. Um, so Carolyn, you were talking about how, you know, you had the warm and fuzzies and, and um, he was saying all these wonderful things. And certainly in my case, um, people know that this has been a part of my experience. Um, that kind of uh, love bombing happened all the time. I was brilliant. I was so amazing. I worked so hard in therapy. I was so insightful and in touch and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it, it, but for me, you're talking four months with me, it was eight years before um, the subtle sexual contact um, actually ended up with sexual intercourse. And so up until that point, I just thought, eh, you know, so, so what that kind of happened, sexual tension is a part of relationships, you know, I'll just ignore it doesn't really mean anything. And I think also because my therapist was female, I didn't read the cues in the same way I would have had she been male. So when she paid for me to go to a conference with her in Orange County, California. Um, we traveled from Vancouver to there and she booked all the travel arrangements. And when we got there, she had booked one room with one bed in it. Now, if she had been a man, I would have gone, oh, I know what this is. You know, I can read all of this. And, and I would have addressed it. But because she was female, I just assumed that, you know, she was, she, you know, this is what this is what women do, you know, they just uh, hang out together like this, and I shouldn't be so um, paranoid and uptight about it. So I just slept on the couch. But I also want to go back to that only person thing, because certainly I got that message as well, that you're the only person that I would do this with. I've never done this before. I've, you know, that you, it's just that you're so special and you're so brilliant and you're so blah, blah, that, uh, that I'm, you know, willing to, uh, uh, put my own career on the line because you're so special. And of course, that also goes back to child molesters and, you know, the whole thing they do about telling their victims that they are special and they don't do this with anybody else and blah, blah, blah. It's so interesting to me, the parallels between um, the different kinds of people out there who are exploiting people and how similar their patterns of grooming are. Mm -hmm. um, so Amy, sorry. Somebody was going to speak. <laughs> oh, wait, I was just agreeing with you. With oh, the similarity okay. in the patterns. Yeah. 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 So, Amy, when you finally went and um, you reported him, what what happened? You were colleagues. Um, did, I, if I'm right, you worked out of the same office. We did. And I, I um Unfortunately, in the ethics codes that govern my license in the in the state, um, we're required to try to intervene. This is a, a code I wholly disagree with. Um, we're required to try when when there's an ethics breach with a colleague, you're try you try to intervene with them on a more informal level before it escalates, and that put me in a really vulnerable position because it shouldn't be my job to decide whether or not this person's fit to practice. And it shouldn't be my job to, you know, to try to stop them from doing 
which is something that is a felony in half the states. You know, it wasn't in the state where I was working, it's strictly prohibited. And, um, and so I, you know, I, I spoke to my uh, supervisors and two attorneys and they gave me a whole script of what to say. Um, and I would say that's where you see a lot of that similar grooming happening. You know, oh my gosh, I really care about you. You're, you know, I want to make you, you know, I just want to reassure you. You're really brilliant. You've been such a good friend to me. I want to be there, you know. Mm -hmm. So he, he just really worked hard to try to get me to believe that I wasn't seeing what I was seeing. Right. And, um, but then, you know, as, as uh, is often the case with abusers, once they realize that you're not going to, you know, that I wasn't going to be silent about this. I, I remember him saying to me, you know, once when I said, I think you should report yourself. I think you should go get some help and, you know, report yourself and see what could happen from that. And he just yelled at me, you know, Amy, nobody ever has to find out about this. Mm. And I just said, but mm. I already know, like, I, I can't, not right. <laughs> take any action on this. Right. I just was trying to, I mean, at that point, I, you know, the, I still had the cognitive dissonance. It's like finding out that your family member is a child molester right. and thinking, you, you know, there must be something I don't understand here. Right. Are you really lonely? What's going on? You know, it was too hard for me to take that. He mm -hmm. was just, you know, he had planned this out from the beginning. And, um, and then when I, I tried to, do as much as I could, but he just became more and more threatening, having lawyers sending me, you know, letter after letter. And then I finally, you know, I finally had it. Um, I even had to get the police involved. And, um, mm. and I, I eventually did make my report to the state, which I wish I had done right away. Right. Um, because that's, I was afraid to make the report. But um, that's when my healing started. And that's when my relief started, because then I had a board who was validating that what right. I saw was completely wrong, that what I was doing of reporting him was completely right. And then it protected me from retaliation in a way that I wasn't protected before I reported. I'm not saying that this is true for everybody who reports, right? Um, but, but at least then it's like the secret's out, it's gonna be public record. You know, now he had to contend with a, a bigger, um, enemy right right <laughs> and a more important one than little of me can, but can even I ask beyond, you yeah. why you were afraid to report him I was afraid that I wouldn't be believed wow um, and you were a I therapist was, reporting uh, your therapist uh, another colleague yes and I was still afraid. you had that mm -hmm. fear yeah and um I was afraid that um it would turn it would backfire on me a lot of my colleagues said you know just just get away from this just get as far away from it as you can because this could really hurt you and that's true it did I had to move my offices twice wow. um I had to uh, there's some unique situations that happened with my uh situation um th that aren't important to go into right now but it's just you know I lost pretty much everything. My husband and I actually moved 500 miles away eventually. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, so just... what I'm also hearing is that a lot of colleagues are knowing this about their colleagues and mm -hmm. not necessarily reporting them. Absolutely not. And you know, that's one of the reasons that I left the field is mm -hmm. I was, I was shocked at how little support I got and how much sympathy he got. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, to me, it's the equivalent of rape. And um, I, you know, it, and I understand too, none of them, none of us were trained in how to handle this. And they were, they were struggling with the cognitive dissonance too of this person who did, you know, I mean, he was not the type of person you would ever imagine would have been doing this. Right. And so I think they just couldn't tolerate it either. Like this guy that I really like, who I've been referring to for years, you're telling me he's done this, yeah. you know? Um, and it was one of the worst cases that the board had ever seen. So, so even, you know, just how sorted it was, how much he had abused his power, how mm -hmm. vulnerable the client was. Um, 
it, it just was so much to bear. So I was afraid that like, was I overreacting? Was I oh, God. too harsh? Yes. What, you yeah, know, there's so much self-doubt after all those years of gaslighting. Yeah. And then when your own colleagues are saying, you know, these, I, I had one colleague who said, these things happen. And I said, yes. no, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. I mean, they don't just happen. It's a series of calculated choices on the part of that therapist yeah. every time. When it happened to me, the person that was my abusive therapist, um, she was a female, which makes it hard to begin with. Mm -hmm. But she was also um, somebody very well known in the city of Vancouver. She was the first direct, she had been around for e eons. So she was the first director of the first transition house for battered women in Vancouver. She co founded the first organization to support children who had been sexually abused in Vancouver. She designed and facilitated the first sexual abuse courses for therapists and police in Vancouver through our Justice Institute, which does all the training here. Um, she was in CAR 86 when it started, which here in Vancouver is the combination of a police officer and a mental health worker who go out on mental health calls. Um, and she was known as an expert on sexual abuse with children and started working with people who were severely traumatized and dissociative um, really early on here. And so it was very well known. She was um, so when it was happening with me, it was, it's kind of the same. It was like, I don't, I don't think I believed it. I mean, she would, she would literally say to me, and this was the entire conversation. She said, um, well, you know, we have a dual relationship and I'd say, yeah. And she said, well, and we know it's transference and, you know, we can talk about that tra transference encounter. Uh, yeah. And she said, okay, so then we're all okay. We're fine. <laughs> and, um, you know, so in my mind, she had covered the bases. And so we must be fine because she was a therapist and she was making these decisions. And it wasn't until I, you know, we, we not only went into a committed relationship, we bought a house together. We bought a house together that had three suites. We lived in different suites. And so we tried to create the illusion that we weren't living together, even though we were. Um, and by the time I separated from her, we're still not getting it that this was really a bad thing that had happened to me. Um, uh, you know, I still didn't really comprehend the importance of how many of her clients and ex-clients were coming in and out of this property. They were everywhere. It was so normalized. What she had done was so normalized that she had clients coming in and painting for her and another client coming in and rewiring parts of her suite and another client coming in and helping to put up a fence. And, and you know, another one came and walked her dog and another one, came, it was just this onslaught of clients coming in and out. It was so normalized. And when I finally sat down and wrote down all the names of her friends, every one of them was either a client, an ex-client, or an ex-employee. And the only alternative to that was a woman who later I found out had been um, accused of, quite um, legitimately accused of, sleeping with her son's teenage friends when she was 40. And Pam was one of the people that supported her during that whole event. And so it just was really interesting to see that that was her only way of having relationships was where she was in a position of power. So um, if I can just jump in. Sure. It's interesting. My therapist, um, he specializes in ethical boundaries in <laughs> therapy <laughs> relationships. <laughs> And he has authored books and yes. I actually reached out to tell uh, because I had, I had wondered if anyone filed a lawsuit against him. So I, I was Googling his name and then law and it came out that he had just done a presentation at a law and ethics conference and he's presenting about the same stuff that he has been doing. Like it was so wow. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, I, again, I put it together that this man who I thought I thought the same thing. I allowed it. It did go on for seven years. It wasn't just the four months. It ended ah, up. Okay. Being, yeah. Right. It ended up going on for a very long time. And that's when I, yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that they they will put themselves in that position. The, mm -hmm. the thing that I did was I left the relationship believing that nobody would believe me. I was the client. She was this big person. And mm -hmm. and she attacked the moment I started separating from her and um, moving on with my life. She attacked me and I still didn't get it that what was going on. I just couldn't understand why she, I, she'd gone from seeing me as this brilliant, bright, amazing, incredible person to somebody that it was okay to treat in the way that she was now treating me. And, um, and the abuse was so significant. I eventually did talk to another one of her clients who she started targeting after me um, and creating that same kind of relationship. And she said that when she was trying to get away from Pam, she did it very differently because she saw what Pam had done to me and she didn't want that to happen to her. It was so, um, you know, I, it, it literally brought me to the point of suicide every day of my life for over a year that, that I, that I just sat with the idea of suicide every day for a year, because I had no way of understanding what had gone on or why, and why it was impacting me in such a big way. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so, um, but I stayed quiet for um, 15 years, I think, I think it was 15 years. And um, it wasn't until the, the sexual assault center here in Vancouver was going to put on an event to honor her as a feminist icon <laughs> that I, I, and I saw that one of my friends, somebody I knew was going to co-sponsor this event that I had to call her and say, you do not want to do this. This is going to bite you uh, later. And, um, and, and I disclosed, and it was kind of the first time that I had disclosed this to anyone, really, I had tried before to report her to her association, um, mostly because I saw what she was doing with this other client. And I knew that other client was already suicidal. And I, I, I just knew it wasn't okay. And um, they, she ended up, uh, we have this little glitch here in Vancouver, BC, where unless you're with the College of Physicians and Surgeons or the College of Psychiatrists or Psychologists, sorry, and you're just with an association, a professional association, there literally is nothing they can do to hold somebody accountable. And so once I handed in all my evidence of this really inappropriate relationship, she, all she had to do was resign her membership and the file was closed and the investigation was done. Um, and so there just didn't seem to be any way to hold her accountable up here at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of them just go on for years and years getting away with this. And, and it's just the way that you describe Pam um, and certainly you too, Carolyn. It, it, they, I, I also have observed that a lot of uh, these abusers really work hard to cultivate that spotless image. And it's like this overcompensation so that if they were ever to be questioned, they have built up this whole cushion. Yes. Um, and, you know, I do think that that is part of the pathology that, that it is a deliberate act on their part, on their part so that people will not um, question them when victims come forward and, and also so that victims will not feel like they can. Yes, to, to put really, I think what you're saying is to put themselves in a position that they are above suspicion, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So yes. that people will Perfect. just assume that that couldn't have happened. But of course, we're also dealing with the fact that a therapist has the power to define the reality of their client. And mm -hmm. I see that happening over and over and over just on this radio program where, you know, certain people think that um, they even, you know, that people are talking about that they're therapist will define something for them that they absolutely know is not true, but they have no right to say differently um, mm -hmm. because nobody's listening. Hey, this is Bernadine Fox, your host for Rethreading Madness, the show that dares to change how we think about mental health. If you're enjoying this podcast, don't miss out on the next episode. Make sure you subscribe. We're continuing our conversation with Carolyn Clement and Amy Avalon about the impact of exploitation by therapists on their clients. So Amy and Carolyn, let's talk a little bit about ethical boundaries. Can we name a few of them? Well, uh, 
one of the things that Carolyn brought up and, and you as well, Bernadine, is, is just what I call the gateway to grooming. And it's, it's the therapist's self-disclosure. And that's mm -hmm. something that we learned from our first day of training. The therapy is not about us. It's about the client. So we right. don't disclose anything personal about ourselves. And usually it, when the therapist begins talking about himself or herself, themselves, um, that's when it, it, you should really know that there's some red flags. Right. Right. That was exactly what happened. Oh, sorry. Um, no, no, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, so in therapy, um, as he started speaking more about himself and his experience, he definitely made sure to let me know that he came from a dysfunctional family and that his background um, had also been tumultuous like mine. And so I, I felt a sense of um, that I could relate to that and that we were on kind of the same level and had a similar understanding because we grew up in the same way. So right. at that point, I just wanted to protect him and you know, take care of him mm -hmm. the same way I was hoping to take care of me. Mm -hmm. So you became emotionally responsible on some level. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things my therapist did was she um, told me <clears throat> she wove it into a session somewhere. And there was lots of times where, um, where um, the, the, uh, the session would take a turn that didn't, wasn't consistent with where the session was going. And so I kind of knew it was something she wanted to say. And one of the things she said was that when she was at um, her university course, learning to become a social worker and having to go through her own counseling as a part of that, this was on Cold Mountain here in BC, um, her counselor had um, to help her deal with her self-image around her own body, told her to take off all her clothes and lie on the floor. And then he commented on her body. But she made me promise before telling me the story that I could never tell anyone because if I did, he would get into a lot of trouble. And so she told me this really sort of personal story. She made it seem okay that this boundary had been violated, that, that it had been an appropriate thing, and then led me into a secret and to see whether or not I would keep the secret. It was, it was an incredible form of uh, uh, grooming and testing, but definitely an ethical boundary. Um, I was also brought into her personal life. So it wasn't just personal stories about herself. It was family events and uh, hanging out with her mother and uh, going on errands, um, doing things outside of therapy a lot, like going for coffee or dinner, um, things like that. So um, increase in contact. Um, yes. That's one thing. I mean, I think it's important for us to talk about these subtle ways that start at the beginning. Um, because an increase in contact could mean, you know, texts and emails, really email and text should be reserved only for scheduling. That's it. Mm -hmm. There should be no clinical exchanges, no personal exchanges. Um, but there's an increase in that more emails, more texts coming from the therapist at different hours in between sessions. And also the sessions extending beyond the allotted mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then more frequent contact you know, more than once a week, more than twice a week, or, you know, even more than that, that is not clinically relevant. Obviously, if you have an acute situation, and you need to see your therapist a couple times a week, but usually, you know, whenever I would do that with patients, it was like, we're going to do this just for a certain amount of time mm -hmm. to get you through this, and then we'll go back. Because you're always trying to, as a therapist, we're always trying to get them to the end of therapy when they're yes. well and yes. leaving therapy. Yes. That is the goal of all therapy to leave therapy and not need the therapist. And so, you know, that increase of contact is also a red flag. Yeah. And just to make it, put it into context, that increase in contact is, it's twofold. One, it creates a dependency on the therapists and, and, and an isolation because the more you're depending on the therapist, the more you're not developing relationships where you can depend on other people in your lives. So that's one thing. But the other part of that contact is that the therapist can constantly check in and make sure that you're not getting it, that maybe something is going awry here that they shouldn't be doing. But that increasing dependency on the therapist, like you said, Amy, the goal of therapy is to leave the client uh, in their own lives and walk out of it as a therapist. So if you're increasing dependency, then what you're doing is uh, entrenching you in somebody's life in a serious way. I would also say that um, creating um, a situation where um, 
um, the therapist is involving themselves in making decisions about your relationships outside of therapy. So they should not be telling you who and who you shouldn't be having a relationship with um, or impacting. I mean, that, those things are your decision. And um, so often I see people where they have been seriously isolated. So by the time the sexual contact goes from, and this is another sort of red flag is, you know, sexual contact, we sometimes think as just um, uh, sexual intercourse, but sexual contact can be a hand up too high on the leg or hold giving somebody a hug way too long or you know all the way up to sexual contact even i think you guys can correct me if you think i'm wrong but i think you know com making comments about somebody's body or what how how they're looking or that has any sexual context in it at all is also sexual contact it's just not physical mm -hmm. right and and hugging i mean hugging or touching just as even friendly hugging and touching really isn't a part of therapy Healthy and yet my my therapist actually made a point to mention I'm not going to touch you I'm keeping my hands to myself mm -hmm. when we were in session as if see I'm, a, I'm one of the good ones I'm not mm -hmm. um and I, actually another thing that he did with self-disclosure is he he spoke about his children a lot he was married and this was the thing it's the back and forth um he just kept promising that in the future it, it's just wait, just wait a little longer. I'm gonna be there, I'm gonna do this. And eventually I realized this is just not gonna happen and I'm just being being played. And that's when it started making sense. Um, and I wish, uh, I don't wanna get ahead, but I wish I had known what um, what abuse looked like mm -hmm. from, because I realized that all the relationships that were problematic in my life actually fit the exact same yes. um, pattern. And that's why I couldn't recognize it when he did it. But as I was doing work with another therapist over several years, that's when I realized that was exactly the issue I had had with my mother and with my brother. And right. so that's why it felt so familiar. Yeah, it felt, it can feel like um, you're, you're, that is just normal. I mean, if you come from a lifetime of abuse, that will feel normal what's going on, but it will feel like somehow you're, you are um, conquering that issue, right? That you've, yeah. you've done well. Like I always thought, well, you know, if my therapist wants to be my friend or my colleague or, you know, my, my in a committed relationship with me, it means that I have done great work in my healing. And that was one of the hardest things for me to come to was recognizing that my relationship with her did not mean that I had um, done a great job in my healing process. It had only meant that I had continued on being a victim. And that was really, really demoralizing for me to recognize at that point. Um, but I think a lot of people don't recognize how serious um, the impact on clients is. That's all bad grammar in there. Um, but um, the, the, the impact, I mean, so often people say that I am worse now than when I started therapy. And, 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 and that's because the damage done by therapists is so incredibly profound. They take people in their vulnerable, they get them to trust them, and then they, they do this exploitation, which uh, is done when the person's defenses are down, they're vulnerable, they are trusting you to help them, and instead they get hurt. And that damage becomes much more profound. I always say that my therapist was my worst predator. Yes. Um, Bernadine, could I just say two things? Sure, um, go ahead. Just about that. So number one, th there's a reason that those boundaries are there, even from the subtle ones, you know, not fostering dependency, keeping to the time and no self-disclosure, which seem, you know, like, well, what's the big deal about that? It is a big deal because the harm is significant when therapists do not obey those standards. They're, they're there for a reason to protect the client. And then the other thing is I just really want anyone who's listening to know and um, the victims of therapy abuse, it, it has nothing, it, it can happen to anybody. It often does. And it's not their own issues or vulnerability that are the reason for this abuse and why it's so hard on them. Everyone's vulnerable when they go into therapy, just mm -hmm. like everyone's vulnerable on an operating table when they're anesthetized. Right. It is the 
abuser that is 100% to blame and 100% the cause of the harm because you could have all the same issues, severe trauma, and you go to an ethical therapist and you will heal. Right. And it's it, it's not because of the, the client at all. I just, I think it's so important to keep the focus on, you know, that these people are harmful yes. and they, and they will cause these symptoms in anybody who is treated this way. It doesn't have, you know, you can be, you don't have to have anything wrong in your childhood. You can have had, you know, pretty great upbringing, but if you get in this tangle with their grooming and their abuse, you will come out with these symptoms. Right. And I think also it's important to say that, um, cause this was one of the things that happened for me as I started to disclose is people would say things like, um, that, you know, well, you had an affair, so what, or Mm -hmm. you're sounding like a scorned lover or, and, and it was really hard for me to uh, turn that language around. Yeah. Victim blaming, but this isn't an affair. And that person is not the lover. These are sexual assaults. um, And those people are rapists. And when it comes to sexual assault, emotional impact uh, or the emotional exploitation is maybe a different thing. But for me, <clears throat> my abusive therapist was a was a rapist, in my opinion. I agree. Oh, absolutely. That's what I started realizing at the end was I never I never gave consent. It was at the very end. I remember at one point I said no to him. I absolutely very clearly said no, and he didn't care. And Um, and that's when I realized all along, he just took whatever he wanted and he never was asking for consent. And then I thought, how can I consent to any of this relationship considering I didn't enter it really with a clear state of mind. So the the seven years was just a mess. I think there are states and Amy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there are states in the U S where consent is not a defense. That's correct. And in fact, I mean, I think it's pretty much in all of the states um, in terms of board and licensure, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of the criminal criminal code, that's different state to state. But no matter what license you have, um, any sexual relationship is is prohibited. And there isn't, um, it doesn't matter if the client says, you know, I consented. In my case, the client tried to defend my colleague to the board saying, you know, no, I, I initiated this. I wanted this. He was the best therapist I ever had. And then like, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, so uh, right. that's pretty much across the board in the U S yeah. And in Canada, it is in our criminal code that a doctor, um, somebody in that position of authority cannot have sex with a client um, that that is considered abuse um, college of psychiatrists, uh, which is the physicians and surgeons here, they cover psychiatrists, um, say you can never have sexual contact with a client, a former client, regardless of time. I think in the psychology college, it's two years or something like that. It starts to become a gray area. Um, But it really does need to be never because the relationship between therapist and client, when you factor in transference, et cetera, it really mirrors that of parent and child. Mm -hmm. So so let's talk a little bit about resources. I'm kind of running out of time. Um, Carolyn, um, you have developed a resource for survivors of exploitation by therapists. Can you tell folks about that? Absolutely. Yes. So. Once I reached out to tell and started gathering information and realized that it was language that I had been missing out on, mm-hmm. um, I really thought, how do I, how can I help other, how do I prevent it from happening to other people? And I have children. So I have decided to create a website that I would have wanted to have um, when I was first trying to make sense of everything. And um, it's called, it's www.unethicalboundaries. Dot com. And um, it's, it's still an ongoing process, but I want to be able to share what my experience has been like and also connect with other um, potential victims and then find ways that we can heal and pass a message on to others. So right. thank that's you. So that's www.unethicalboundaries, all one word, dot com. Did I get that right? Okay, great. And Amy, you and I both uh, volunteer our time for TAL. Maybe you can tell folks what TAL is. So it's the Therapy Exploitation Link Line. And 
Hotel has been around for decades. Uh, it's an email support service as well as a website at www.therapyabuse.org uh, where you can go. You don't have to reach out to us. You can get a lot of information just coming to our website alone. In fact, I didn't reach out to tell for a year and a half, um, but I went to the website frequently just to get validation from all the, the great articles and resources there. Um, and then of course you can uh, certainly send us an email. There uh, are about 12 volunteers with us and we will uh, do our best to respond to your unique situation with the right. resources that we feel can help. And the nice thing about having so many people who do respond to emails that are coming in is that each one of us has a wealth of information and we come at it from a different perspective or have had a different experience and can offer a great deal from a wide range of people. And of course, people can reach me here at rethreading madness at coopradio.org. Um, I have um, created my own checklist. Uh, it was one of the things that I did on Tal's website um, that uh, was a pivotal moment in my life. I had actually went on Tal to do the checklist to prove to myself that I, even though my relationship had toasted and was a nightmare, <clears throat> it had been special that what we had was unique and different and one of a kind and, 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 and I remember doing that checklist and box after box after box after box. I was like checking them off until I literally had practically checked off everything on the checklist um, and had to recognize that, you know, what, what had, you know, thrilled me about how my therapist was with me, that whole gaslighting, not gaslighting, but love bombing and everything was really grooming. And the grooming process for these folks is so similar. So I actually recreated the checklist and I have it and I can send it out to anybody. It's free. Um, just like all the resources on tell are there's one article after another, after another, and a free ebook for people. So, so um, thank you, both of you for um, having this conversation. I feel like we just touched on it, like the tip of the surface mm -hmm. in this hour. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. For for Thank work. you so much. I'm your host, Bernadine Fox, and that's our show for this week. If you find yourself needing resources at this point, don't hesitate to look any of us up. Given the contact information that we already provided, I will also be posting this information on our website under resources. We will be happy to assist you in any way we can. Again, my thanks to Carolyn Clement and Amy Avalon for sharing their stories with me and you all. But most importantly, and as always, my thanks goes out to you for joining us today. Stay safe out there. I'm Bernadine Fox, and you've just listened to Rethreading Madness, the podcast that dares to change how we think about mental health. We air live on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM, every Tuesday at 5 p.m. or online at coopradio.org. If you have questions or feedback about this program or want to share your story or have something to say to us, we want to hear from you. You can reach us by email, rethreadingmadness at coopradio.org. Org. If you enjoyed this show, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode.
say Just words people say to be nice Some 